Over the years, I have heard of stories leaking out of national parks about strange creatures, beings that people can't understand. I've never personally experienced any myself, but I always wondered if there was any truth to these stories. So you can imagine how intrigued I was recently when I was talking to a friend about this. He told me that his father-in-law always talked about seeing something strange, something that was definitely alive but looked nothing like anything he had ever seen before, and that it had happened decades ago. Of course, this all piqued my interest, but what really added to the intrigue was that this happened to him while he was working in Oregon at Crater Lake National Park back in the 60s. He was assigned to the North Rim area of the caldera and was working on a trail project. He was clearing brush and doing a lot of repair work, and one night he realized he had forgotten his work bag, and so he went back to the work site soon after clocking out to get it. He was there on the North Rim and began walking along the trail that led to where he had been working, and it was then that he felt a presence, like something was watching him. He says that at the time he had no idea what it was, but he knew that it was definitely there. He continued walking, and shortly thereafter heard a strange singing noise coming from the forest, like a woman or a child was out there. He says it was haunting and strange, and he said it seemed to be coming from the direction where he had been working, which made him apprehensive about continuing. He actually became so concerned that he decided he would just retrieve the bag the next day. So he turned around, started to head back to his truck. He began walking back, but it wasn't long before he heard footsteps walking in the distance behind him, following him. He turned around but saw no one. So he quickened his step and continued walking. And at the time, he then again heard footsteps following him, now keeping pace with him. They walked when he walked. They stopped when he stopped. He said it wasn't long before he felt a strong sense of danger. So he then started to run back to his truck. And then just before arriving there, he turned around and that's when he saw it. When he turned around, he saw the whites of two eyes looking at him, piercing at him from the darkness. He also felt again that strong sense of evil. As he stared in the direction of the eyes, the rest of the creature then slowly revealed itself to him. What he saw was completely pale gray in color, and he said that it kept low to the ground, and yet it was able to move very fast at the same time. He said that he was only about 20 feet away from it when he saw it. He said then that it paused when he stopped at his truck, and it looked up at him with large, black, round eyes that seemed to be too big for its head, almost alien-like in appearance. It stared at him without moving or blinking at all, but soon quickly turned and disappeared into the undergrowth. After standing there shocked for a minute or two, he then stepped forward to try to find it, and he looked around continually for about an hour or so, but couldn't locate anything. No sign of it at all. He said that he had worked in the park for years, and he knew that area like the back of his hand, so he was surprised that nothing showed itself that was out of place. He then decided to give up and started heading back to get to his truck but he found that in good conscience he didn't want to do that, thinking that the creature could be dangerous, and with people in that area every day, who knows what could happen. And so he returned to where he saw it, and now there were some tracks which looked like dog tracks, but bigger than they should have been. And also what struck him as odd was that it looked like there were only four toes on each print rather than five that you would expect from a normal dog. So after looking at these tracks for a few minutes, trying to work out what made them, he had this very strange sensation while standing there. He said his mind seemed to blank out, and he couldn't remember why he was there or what had happened there. So he then decided to leave the area and head home, which he was able to do without incident. But the next day, while at work, his boss rang him and asked him if he had seen anything strange in that area when he was there earlier since another worker had reported seeing something unusual also. He said yes, and proceeded to describe the creature with gray skin and eyes that were like black holes. But his boss was dismissive to that description, and tried to offer up explanations that didn't entertain an unknown creature. The boss was almost even patronizing about it, to the point where he made the friend's father-in-law go back with him to look at the area again and look for the tracks. 
Once they arrive to the area and after looking around a few minutes, he remembers that his mind seemed to go blank again. He blacked out a little bit just like before, and when he looked up from the tracks, his boss was gone. He then looked down at his watch, and over two hours had passed. It was now noon, and he couldn't remember the previous two hours, and that terrified him. He walked back to the parking lot, hoping to find his truck, and thankfully it was there. He got in and immediately returned to the main building, where he found his boss sitting in his office. He walked up to his boss's office, asked him about what had happened, but his boss just looked up as if nothing had happened, and asked how his day was going, very nonchalantly. At that point, my friend's father-in-law knew that what he was experiencing was not normal at all, and the thought crossed his mind that it might even be extraterrestrial, or some other kind of unworldly creature that had played with his mind. But he had no idea what. That day he went home early because he had been left very shaken up, but just said he wasn't feeling well. Ultimately, it apparently took quite some time before he told his story, as it obviously had shaken him up quite badly. Now I've known my friend who told me this about his father-in-law for many years, and he's a very straight-up guy who would not tell stories to make people uncomfortable, or laugh even. He told me this story just like I've told you without adding any embellishments. And also, his father-in-law was quite a private person and never really talked about what he saw to anyone else other than immediate family. So that makes me sure that he did not make up the story. So after hearing this story from the family directly, I thought that perhaps you all might be interested in hearing it, which is why I'm sharing it with you here. It seems that there could be more truth behind some of those National Park stories after all. I've been listening to your channel for a while, waiting to hear if anyone has seen what I've seen. And so far, everybody's been talking about land creatures, but has anyone ever had a weird experience out at sea? I saw something out in Buzzards Bay in Wareham, Massachusetts that really freaked me out. My buddy and I were out fishing there last Sunday, and we saw something breaking the surface about 20 feet away from us. He said, dolphin. I said, no, it's a whale. But then it got closer, and we got another look. It was a weird blue-green color when it rose up a little, and it made a hump like a camel has. But it was shimmery, not the color of a whale or a dolphin. A brighter color, like those fancy tropical fish that you can buy. So we were thinking it was some sort of a floating trash that was reflecting the light. I don't know, just bobbing up from the current or something. But the weird thing was, it kept getting closer to us, way faster than the current would bring it. And then it stopped. It disappeared for a few minutes, and I was guessing it had sunk. A few minutes later, we're just chilling, kicked back with our rods, and the strangest thing started happening. The water began to swirl around us, maybe in a 15-foot parameter with us in the middle. Little waves cresting and going in in a circle around us. I never saw anything like it, and neither had my buddy, because he sat right up and said, What the hell? At first I laughed, because he's this big guy, and he looked a little nervous, and I was thinking there had to be a rational explanation, like we were caught in a school of bluefish or something. But it started getting closer, like the circle was closing in on us. The waves going around us seemed like they were getting taller. Not really tall, but rising enough to make me put down my rod and grab the side of the boat. Now my boat isn't big, it's a 16-footer, but the force from whatever this was started making the boat swivel. Now we weren't spinning fast or anything, but we were doing a circle. And then we were both like, what the hell is going on? And I said, let's get out of here. He said, yeah. So I tried to fire up the motor, which is a 60-horsepower Yamaha four-stroke that I got a year ago. That thing's never given me any trouble, but it wouldn't start. I mean, completely dead. The water was choppy, and the boat had started rocking a little because the waves were spinning faster around us now. I just gave up on the motor after about eight tries because I was freaking out now, too. And we just needed to move. Now. So I grabbed an oar, he grabbed the other one, we paddled right out of that spinning circle. I was pretty relieved because I'd had this terrible fear that the waves were going to get higher and trap us. Yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you had to have been there. 
We waited a few minutes and I couldn't even see the whirlpool thing anymore. And my buddy said, do you want to go in? I'm thinking that's a long way to paddle and pretty soon somebody's going to come by. It's a well-traveled area and they could give us a tow. And the weirdness had disappeared, right? So I said, let's wait. So we cast our lines again. It was just like two minutes later that something took my bait. Something big. And the rod bent. Almost double. I'm thinking it's a striper. You know, it was only five years ago that that guy caught a 65-pound striper right here in Buzzards Bay. Whatever it was, it was wicked big. I was afraid if I didn't tire it out, my rod was going to snap. So I let it run a bit, and then I reeled it in some. I did that a few times, you know. It started going soft, getting tired, so I took up a lot of slack all at once, pulling that sucker in right quick before it caught a second wind. I got it closer and closer, and the damnedest thing started happening. The whirlpool thing was back, circling around the boat. I was like, screw this, though. I'm still getting my fish, so I just kept pulling it in. But then suddenly... I could see what I had caught. I saw it through the water about six feet down, and it was no fish. This thing had a bunch of legs like an octopus. Maybe not eight. I wasn't stopping to count, but more than four. Almost like tentacles, and it was this iridescent color between blue and green. Its body wasn't round either. It was long and skinny and tapered on one end. I yelled to my buddy to get his camera ready. I needed him to get a picture as soon as I brought the thing up, because I could already tell that this was one of those times no one will believe you unless you get a picture. So he grabs his phone, and he leans over the side a bit, and then he sees it, and he says, What the hell is that? And as soon as he says that, the thing rolls over, and I can suddenly see its head. I couldn't believe it, even though it was right in front of me. The thing had a face. Not a human face, but not a reptile face either, like a human-reptile crossbreed. The only reference I can think of is that this creature was from the Black Lagoon, except that it had all these crazy tentacle legs. And now the thing was looking right at me with these flat black eyes, and I froze. I stopped pulling. I didn't want that thing any closer, no way. But I yelled to my buddy, take a picture through the water, take it now. As soon as I shouted, one of the legs came up and smacked hard onto the side of the boat, right next to where my friend was leaning over. I swear I thought it was going to grab him, take a hold of him, and pull him under. He stumbled back, dropping his phone, making us rock so hard I thought we were going to capsize. And that's when I let my rod go, crouching down and hanging on with both hands because no way did I want to be in the water with that thing. The boat steadied, so I leaned to look over the edge just a little, I couldn't see it anymore. It must have dove down once I let go of the rod. But I decided to cut the line. My buddy yelled, What the hell are you doing? But man, that thing looked meaner than an eel, and it must have weighed 80 or 90 pounds. Just judging from its creepy face and the way that it moved, it seemed to have intelligence. I wasn't going to play around with it. That was some sort of a supernatural something. I did not want to mess with it. Anyway, the whirlpool around us was gone now too, so maybe it created that somehow. Or maybe there were more of them around us. Jeez, that's a scary thought. Okay, and another weird thing is, when I tried to fire up the motor a minute later, it worked. Cranked up on the second try. Maybe a coincidence, but I'm not sure. Well, that's it. If anyone else has seen anything weird out in Buzzards Bay, I want to hear about it. Dear Lilith, I'm a realtor in Gaylord, Michigan, which I feel is a great place to live. The city has beautiful views of the Great Lakes and Lake Charlevoix. It's also close to both Traverse City and Petoskey, making for easy day trips. If you're looking for some outdoor adventure, a hike through the Gaylord State Forest is a great way to spend a day which is exactly what I was planning on doing after work. It was June 15th in 2017, and I had just gotten done showing a few houses to clients who lived in southern Michigan. They were basically looking for a great place to raise their kids. The husband recently got transferred to Gaylord, and they loved the town. From my assessment, I could see that they would probably be happy here. 
So after we looked at their seventh house, their brains were on overload, and we decided to call it a day. I called my husband Rick to see if he was done for the day, too. He was, so we made plans to meet at Gaylord State Forest to do a little afternoon hike. It took me about 15 minutes to get there. He got there about 10 minutes later. So we walked our normal loop through the park, starting off on one of our favorite trails, the Woodland Trail. As I look back on it, I remember that something didn't seem right that day. Something was off. But at the same time, I just pushed those thoughts out of my head since Rick and I were deep in conversation. We walked for about 45 minutes and talked about all sorts of topics like how Rick's work was going since he recently got a promotion and what we might do to celebrate my birthday that was coming up in a few weeks. At one point, we stopped and looked at each other as a shrill noise cut through the air a noise unlike anything either of us had ever heard before. We stood there listening, listening for a few minutes, but when it didn't happen again, we continued on. We eventually ended up close to Lake Charlevoix and stopped at a few picnic benches to have a bite to eat. I opened my day pack and took out an apple. Rick got out his usual trail mix. We made sure to carry out any of our trash, too, since we were very aware of leaving nothing left behind. Eventually, we continued on with our walk, this time heading to the ridge trail, which took us through pine trees before reaching a lookout point. There we could see more of Lake Charlevoix below. Everything was still strangely still and quiet, though. Looking back, there were no forest sounds at all at this point, which, knowing what I know now, makes sense. From there, we stopped at the falls for a few minutes, making sure we didn't stay too long since it was getting close to sunset and it would be easy to get lost in this area of the park after night. We started back towards our cars, talking about how the next time we should just bring some fishing gear because there's also a stream where people catch trout. And right then, we heard the shrill scream again. But just like before, it only happened once, and didn't happen again. Even still, we picked up our pace a bit and continued to head back the way we had come. We crossed a bridge over Meadowbrook Creek that's one of many that connects the parts of the park, and it was now dusk, and Rick stopped and pointed out what he thought might be an eagle's nest high above in the trees. Luckily, I had my zoom lens with me so we could get a closer look, and sure enough, it was an eagle's nest, and Rick spotted one of the eagles perched on top of the tree, looking down at us from its vantage point in the branches. Now Rick's an avid bird watcher. I never really got that into it, but I do find them interesting. He then also pointed out a black-capped chickadee that was perched on the side of our path. That one right there, that's the black-capped chickadee, and he went on and on, but I was barely listening after a while. I realized that I was still feeling creeped out by those screams that we heard, and I eventually interrupted him and told him I just wanted to keep moving along back towards the car because I was feeling weird. He was good about it. He agreed to head back with me. So we started off in silence. And then, as we headed back, we began to smell something foul that seemed to be coming from the path ahead of us. I mentioned it to Rick, and he said he smelled it too. Said that he thought it was probably just a skunk, though. But as far as I was concerned, this did not smell like a skunk. It was a really foul odor. I was thinking it might be the carcass of something big like a deer or even a coyote. Eventually, we made the left turn at the fork in the path, and that's because we had seen the tree that was completely covered in bird poop. That was actually our landmarker that told us that we were close and on the right path that would take us back to our cars. But this is also when I really noticed something wasn't right. I felt a change in the air, and all the birds stopped chirping, and all the movement in the forest stopped, and it got really quiet. Rick also noticed it. It made me think of all the movies where something bad happens to campers or hikers right at this point. And this was all just too weird for me not to be worried. We literally started jogging and reached a clearing in the woods when we heard unusual sounds. Loud, obvious sounds, especially noticeable with all the other silence in the woods. They sounded like huge branches snapping off from trees, or even like trees were being knocked down or pushed over by something coming closer to us. And that's when we saw it. We both saw it. The creature was eight or nine feet tall 
and had mangy fur all over its body. It had the head of a German shepherd or maybe a wolf, but the body of a man. Its eyes glowed yellow, and it was snarling at us with fangs like something out of a horror movie. Had I manifested this thing? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't understand it. What was I seeing? Rick grabbed me, pulled me behind a tree, but it was too late. The creature had seen us and was now coming directly at us, running as fast as a horse would gallop. Luckily, Rick always carries his pistol with him on our walks just for protection, and he fired at the ground in front of the creature. The noise of the gun startled it, which caused it to rear up its head and let out a shrill scream. The exact scream that we had heard earlier, twice. I was now completely frozen in my tracks. I was sure we were about to be attacked. But before I could say or do anything, the thing turned off the path and fled into the woods. Rick and I were speechless. All we could do was look at each other. He finally was able to yell, run, and we both bolted to our cars. We got in his car, sat there for a little bit as neither one of us felt able to drive. We were both blabbering simultaneously, trying to process it, but it was obvious that we both felt that we had been lucky to escape with our lives. I was never a believer of monsters before, but this day changed me. I'll admit it. Now it's been years since this experience happened, but it still haunts me, both when I'm awake and when I'm asleep. I hear Rick dreaming about it too, but I've never brought that up with him because I don't want him to have to think about it when he's awake. I mean, it seems like he doesn't remember his dreams because he doesn't talk to me about them, but I can't be sure. Maybe he's just protecting me. Rick and I still do go hiking, but we haven't been back to Gaylord State Forest since that incident. He always still brings his pistol, and we never go hiking close to dusk or dawn. I've read folklore about the Michigan Dogman, and I thought it was all make-believe. But when I saw that thing, that creature with my own eyes, and experienced it running straight at us, I knew then that there really are true mo- I lived in Louisiana in an apartment complex when I was in high school, and I loved to hunt the woods near there that were within walking distance. I almost lived in those woods. They had beautiful oak trees and trails. So one day I was hunting with my bow in a nearby pasture which had a barbed wire fence separating it from those woods. I know I shouldn't have probably been there, but I was young and stupid and I didn't care. I'd shot a rabbit there just a few days earlier with a razor blade arrow. I was walking down the fence line this day on the pasture, heading towards the corner where the fence went off to the left, towards the apartments. And that's when I heard something large in the woods coming straight towards me, crashing through the brush. It made me really curious because here the woods are very thick, hard to walk through. Also, no one ever really went in this part of the woods except for me. They were like my woods. I said, who are you? What are you doing here? No answer. I repeated it. Still no answer. They just kept coming closer. And then they got to about 25 feet from me. And then it made me mad that they weren't answering. So I almost jumped over the fence and ran over there to see who was only 25 feet away and not answering. But then I remembered that about a week ago, I'd seen a man in his 40s with a long-barreled revolver on his hip across the creek and coming from an area that had an abandoned barn. And that area always gave me the creeps. I just never went over there. So I caught myself right before I jumped over the fence and said to myself, something here does not seem right. By this time, I was at the corner of the fence line. I turned left and continued to follow it towards the apartment. And then I heard what I thought was a person. I thought it was a person as my initial instinct, because basically 40 years ago, we didn't believe in cryptids or supernatural stuff or anything like that. So I stopped walking, but it stopped too. So I started walking again, and it started walking. I could hear it alongside of me, continuing to stay about 25 feet away. Now, the woods are very thick here in Louisiana, so you really couldn't see through them. As I walked, I made sure that my razor blade arrow was well-notched, and I never took my eyes off of the direction of who was walking parallel to me. And then it came to a part of the woods that I can never get through. 
because there's a different type of brush here, one that's about five or six feet tall and very, very sharp. I even remember that once I shot a bird there and tried everything I could to get to the bird and couldn't crawl under that brush or over it. I wasn't afraid to go through it, I just physically couldn't. But anyway, this thing started crashing through this crazy thick brush. As I began to walk fast, then I saw for a split second a really tall black figure crashing through. It was solid black, maybe eight to ten feet tall. It had to have been huge to step over those five to six foot bushes. And then I could see it from about the chest up from where I was. It had its arms in the air and out in front of it. And its torso was leaning forward, but it didn't look like it had any clothing on, which I thought was weird. But that's when it hit me that it wasn't a man, but something else. And I had no idea what. All I saw was the black silhouette type thing. So I took off running. Well, it did too. It paralleled me all the way to the parking lot. When it reached the large tree right there next to the parking lot, it started smashing and snapping large limbs from the tree. Limbs that were maybe four to six inches in diameter. Well, I jumped the fence right there and ran into the apartment. I never got the impression that it was anything I could specifically identify. I thought it was something paranormal, but I didn't have a clue as to what. I mean, we didn't have the internet back then. So for years, I thought about why this creature had decided to do this to me, to show itself, to be near me. The only thing I could think of was that I had shot a rabbit a few days earlier and immediately cut it open to clean it in the pasture. But as I began to skin it, I saw that it had worms, so I just left it there. These woods were not very large, only about a quarter mile by a half mile long and in an urban setting. So I thought there was no way it could be anything unexplainable. But what was it? So from that day on, any time I was in those woods again, I did not shoot anything. I don't eat in there. I don't try to break even the smallest twig in there, no matter how small. I don't smash the grass or leave any trail. And when I pee, if it's possible... I dig a hole and I cover it up. I'm basically super cautious now. And if I ever have somebody with me, I ask them to whisper. Because I feel like we should respect the woods and the animals who live there. And of course, all the paranormal creatures too. This happened to me back sometime in March or April of 2013. It was just beginning to be springtime, but not quite. It was also still pretty foggy and rainy, but at least it was past the freezing part of the season. So I was on Facebook one night when I got a message from a close friend of mine. I hadn't spoken to him in over a month, but we were pretty decent friends. We would talk on and off. He had a habit of randomly inviting me over for little get-togethers or parties at the last minute. I always gave in. Well, this night, it was roughly 7.30, he shot me a message and asked if I was available to come hang out with him and a few mutual friends. I said yes. He told me to be there around 9, so in an hour and a half. I relaxed a bit longer, got ready. He lives about 20, 25 minutes away from me, a little bit out of town where there's not a lot of houses. His house is up on a hill surrounded by a bunch of trees, and the front of his house is not like a typical driveway. It's just dirt from all the driving around on it, with anywhere from four, five, or six cars parked out front at any given time. Also, a really bright floodlight illuminates that area. You have to pull off this dusty gravel road and then right up to his house, and that's it. But the land around is amazing. In the back of his house is a really large hill that kind of slopes down where he has this large bonfire and woods surrounding all of that. Well, that's only relevant to include here because, well, that's where we would usually go party and have fun. So you can picture how we didn't have to worry about neighbors since none were really close by, at least not for a half a mile in either direction. So now driving out to his house, everything was fine. It was a little foggy with somewhat clear skies, not rainy. I think it was a little wetter than usual considering the time of year, so anyway, I pull up to his house and the floodlight comes on. And then as soon as it does, I see this large shape, like a dog shape, 
but the largest dog I've ever seen in my life, jump out from behind his Ford and land right next to my car on the ground. It looks at me and then runs off into the bushes. I was kind of freaked out. This thing was like the size of a lion, you know, like lions in Africa, something that could easily pounce and kill you. I remember very clearly parking my car, jumping out and running to the back of the yard where everybody was because I was so spooked and I didn't want to be out there alone. I ran right up to him and I said, dude, you have a flipping lion in your front yard. He looked at me strangely and laughed. I think he thought I was already drinking or something. But I explained to him what happened. He and his sister and a couple of our other friends who were already there were curious, but basically they laughed it off. I guess they thought I was either playing a prank or just joking around. But I insisted, and I kept going on about how serious I was, and that what I saw did indeed happen. But they paid no attention to that and basically continued going on doing their thing. So I had no choice but to just get over it at that point. Well, as the night went on, we quickly forgot all about the whole giant wolf dog thing that I saw. At least that's what I kept thinking the shape looked like, a giant dog. I mean, I didn't really see exact details because it was dark and the floodlight came on at the front of the house, which it was so bright it just gave me a large silhouette to look at. But as the night went on, probably closer to midnight, I had drunk a little but not a lot, and then eventually my friend who invited me over was beginning to fall asleep. He's a heavier drinker than I am, and although I enjoy it, I'm much more of a social drinker. But anyway, there were some other mutual friends who had arrived later. They were all getting pretty inebriated, too, you know, laughing and talking loudly. And that's when we started hearing noises off in the woods, in the distance. But I didn't really hear them, or I should say I didn't really take note of them at first. Between the bonfire and the beginning of the woods, maybe 200 yards or so, it's a pretty large open space. I mean, you could easily go ATVing. I think there were woods and trees around there at one point, but before my friend bought the property, it was all cleared and torn out, so it's just this big, giant clearing that he keeps mowed. Well, anyway, we heard all sorts of crashing noises and crashing in the woods, sounding like a large animal coming through the trees. I didn't hear any howling or any other animal noises exactly, just this crashing sound, like something trampling about. I'm trying to paint this picture for you, but I can't really get the words, but imagine the Hulk and put him in the middle of the woods, like in the dark forest at nighttime. Imagine the noise he would make moving around, pushing trees over, stomping. You would probably guess that there was some sort of heavy machinery in there. But yeah, that's how loud it was, except no machinery sounds were accompanying it, just crashing and thrashing. Some of our friends were mildly concerned, I would say mildly because their state of inebriation took over more than their concern about what was in the woods. I was really the only one that began to get nervous at this point, and it went on for quite a while, I would say close to an hour on and off, but then it suddenly stopped. All the noises from the forest stopped, even the sounds of the night crickets, even the wind. It was dead silent. And now it was about 1 or one thirty in the morning, and most everybody but I was out of it. So much so that they were able to ignore any eeriness that was lingering in the air. I sat out there in the quiet for maybe 10, 15 minutes, but then I made the announcement that I was going to go inside, lay down, and figure that they should all come with me. I said so, too. That we should all just put out the bonfire and make it a night. Some of them agreed, but... One of our friends didn't want to come in and insisted on staying out there. Whatever, I know it was probably a mistake, but I left him stay out there. I would say most of us decided to put out the fire and go in, but a few did stay out there, still talking and laughing. I guess they came in at some point during the night, but I had fallen asleep by then. Luckily, my friend had a pretty big house and a really big living room, so there were many places on the floor to crash. He had mattresses and pads all over, so it wasn't hard to find a spot. I mean, he had his living room set up in a way that 10 or 15 people could be there at any given time. Pretty nice setup, actually. It worked out in our favor, not to mention the giant windows overlooking the yard. Through them, you could perfectly see out to the bonfire area and where all the woods were. Even though I was pretty creeped out, I decided to just fall asleep, and miraculously, I did.
Well, the next day, I woke up early, I looked around, and everybody was inside. I was one of the first ones up, though, and decided I should just head home, since I figured everybody'd be sleeping for a while longer. But then I noticed my friend was awake, too, so I talked to him a bit and asked him how things went. And then I told him again about the experience that I'd had, hoping to explain about the thing that I saw and why I was so uncomfortable the previous night. He said... When he left the fire to go back in the house, he was one of the last ones out there. Just two people were still out there. He told me that as he walked to the house, he too had this intense feeling like something or somebody was watching him. He said he looked around, but noted nothing looked strange, and then remarked how weird it all sounds. Weird because it coincides with exactly what I told him happened to me. He felt like something or somebody was watching him through the woods. I asked him, could it have been neighbors? He said, no, the only neighbor who lives about a half mile away in that direction is an elderly couple. So they would never be going through the woods or near his property at 1.30 or later in the morning. I mean, the couple was at least 80, so there's no way, no reason that that would be happening. Anyway, I know this is probably a dumb story to share because I don't really even have a resolution but that's because this is exactly how it happened. Both me and my friend totally just got creeped out, separately, by the same thing. And I never did figure out what that silhouette of this large dog was or what the crashing sounds were in the woods. I can't help but find it all really scary that this weird stuff happened to not only me, but him as well on the same night. It makes me think that it maybe really did happen. I mean, we both acknowledged it. Everybody else, though, seemed to downplay it severely. Maybe they knew, but they really didn't want to know. Like I said, this was back in 2013. I've had no sort of experience like that since then. And it's really been the only experience that I've ever had that was even remotely weird. And I've been out there many times since that day. Nothing weird happened. So maybe it was just a fluke. I'm not sure. But maybe we truly did encounter a creature that night. But I guess I'll never know. I just hope that it doesn't... I'm a 10-year veteran of the New Jersey Highway Patrol, so forgive me for not attaching my name to this. I'd be laughed right off the force, but I swear to you that every word of what I'm about to say is true. A few months ago, I was out on patrol, cruising back roads along the Pinelands when I got a call from some frantic teenagers reporting that they had run into the Jersey Devil. My fellow patrolman and I had a good laugh about the call over the radio, but it's obligatory that we take every call seriously, and since I was the closest, I said I'd go check it out. When I got there, I found four scared teenagers huddled inside a Ford Focus with the doors locked. The front two tires were both flat, and they were pulled off to the side of the road with their flashers on. I waved for them to get out of the car and talk to me, but none of them seemed to really be too keen on the idea. Finally, though, I managed to coax out the driver, who asked me to shine my spotlight on the car so that the others could feel safe coming out. I did that for him, and finally I had all four kids on their feet and ready to talk to me. The first thing I noticed about the kids was that they all smelled pretty strongly like they'd been partaking in some extracurricular plant-based activities. Right off, I figured they had gotten their hands on some stuff that was a little too strong, and they had embarked on a real bad trip together. It was a good thing the tires on that little Ford were already nearly bald when they came down the gravel, it flattened the front ones because they were in no shape to be driving. I figured the experience of the bad trip would be punishment enough for smoking, though. After all, I was a kid once myself, and they seemed otherwise pretty harmless. Not to mention they were all about to have to face their parents, too. I had each one of them call home for a ride and promised I would stay with them until they were all picked up. The two girls were picked up first and eager to get away. Next was the boy who had ridden passenger. His mom threw an absolute fit and cussed him two ways from Tuesday before she ever even got him in the car. Now it was down to just me and the driver in the end. I made him help me push the car off the side of the road so it wouldn't be hit by anyone throughout the night, 
at least until he and his dad could come back and haul it home the next morning. At one point, he seemed to realize that I didn't believe what he had seen. You know I'd never lie to a cop, he said. I told him I was sure that they'd seen something that scared them, but that they needed to lay off the weed because it clearly had made them paranoid. It slashed my tires, though, he said. He was almost pleading with me at that point to come and take a look. I didn't figure there was any point in arguing with the kid any further. I just told him that I was glad he called and that they were getting everybody home safely. And that's about the time that his dad pulled up. The first thing the dad wanted to know was if it had been the Jersey Devil that popped the tires. The son said that it had, and the dad went off telling us both this wild story about how he had seen the thing when he was a teenager. By then, I was figuring that the kid's paranoia and hallucinations must be related to a genetic thing, or that maybe his parents had done a little too much of the devil's lettuce in their day, too. Dad wound up taking the kid, and I got back in my car to leave. My spotlight was still shining on the back of the car, and before I shut it off, I guess I let curiosity get the better of me. I got out, and I walked over to the car and shone my flashlight on the tires. I wanted to see if they were really ripped to shreds, like the kid kept saying. Oddly enough, they were. There were three distinct cuts down the sidewalls of both tires, each spaced about an inch apart. And right then, I heard the most god-awful screech above me and shone my flashlight towards the sky. Whatever was up there had this wingspan at least as wide as the road. I booked it back to the car and headed out of there as quickly as I could. I forgot to even let dispatch know that I was leaving until they called me for a status report. And when I told them I'd been back on patrol for at least half an hour, they radioed back that they were glad to hear it. They thought that the devil might have got me. We all had a good laugh about that, but I never let them know just how close that joke came to being reality. But they wouldn't believe me anyway. So... Here I am sharing with you. I used to share my weird experience a lot when I was younger. I was naive enough to think some people would believe me, but most of the time they didn't. They just made up excuses saying it was dark outside, I was mistaken or tired, etc., etc. So I stopped talking about it. But after hearing your show, I knew I had to share this with you and your listeners. I'm from the Lower Peninsula of Michigan, the top of the mitten if you know what that means. Up north is what you would call it if you're from Detroit. There's not much up here except lakes and trees, but it's pretty though, and we get lots of tourists in the summer. The winters are cold, everyone except the locals leave, and there aren't that many of us to go around. So like most rural teenagers at that time, we used to head up into the woods to have a bonfire. It was during one of those bonfires that it happened. This was before cell phones were really a thing, at least not up here yet, so when we were partying, we were cut off from the rest of the outside world. Our normal spot was this farmer's field surrounded on all sides by woods. We learned from the older kids to wait until late fall or early winter to start going there after the farmer hauled in the last harvest so we knew there wouldn't be anyone up there. It was sort of a rite of passage in my town. When you were a sophomore or junior, one of the seniors would let you tag along to one of their parties and show you the spot. Nobody got crazy at these things. It was too cold, and we heard too many stories of kids getting lost in the snow or losing fingers to frostbite. But we always had a good time. I'm telling you this because most people brush off what I tell them, saying I was just a young and panicked teenager. But I was in my right mind when it happened. My sophomore year, we were having one of these bonfires in the field. Everything was normal. Everyone was having a good time. We were burning pieces of an old barn and some furniture an old lady had left out for trash. My best friend at the time... I'll call him Mike, for his anonymity was grilling up some frozen burger patties next to me in a rusty old charcoal grill we kept out there. Sarah, also not her real name, was standing with us too, chatting away like she always did, when we heard this low, rumbling growl. 
I looked towards the sound of the growling, and at the edge of the firelight I saw two predatory eyes reflecting the fire back at me. I nudged Mike and Sarah and slowly pointed in the direction of the eyes, trying not to startle whatever was watching. We were about ten yards from the nearest group of partygoers. Sarah was terrified, and she walked slowly backwards towards them. She never took her eyes off of the edge of the firelight. I don't even think she took a breath the entire time she walked away. I had the exact opposite reaction, was fascinated by the glowing eyes in the dark. We had been hearing reports that gray wolves were coming back into the Lower Peninsula from Canada and Wisconsin for a few years now, but all anybody saw were flashes on trail cams or tracks in the snow. The Fish and Game Commission couldn't even make up their minds if these were real signs of wolves or just people mistaking dogs and coyotes. I was excited at the prospect of being the first person in Lower Michigan to see a wolf in the flesh. I could tell Mike was excited, too, because as I slowly stalked forward for a better look, he was glued to my side. Walking up to a potential wolf is basically the stupidest thing you could do, but I was young and I could hear the whispers and the murmurs behind me as Sarah alerted the rest of the party to watch what was going on. I couldn't back down now. Everyone was watching, and I was a newbie. Mike and I were about seven or so yards away from the supposed wolf by now, and I could just barely make out the outline of its ears and its head. It looked almost like a large German shepherd, but with a broader snout and wider ears. The growling got lower, more menacing, like it was no longer a warning, but an actual threat. I've heard a million dogs growl, but this was more raspy and guttural, like there was something mismatched between the creature's vocal cords and its chest. Mike stopped moving and turned back. I was scared and wanted to turn back too, but I wanted to be the big man at the party. I wanted the other kids, the upperclassmen at the bonfire, to tell the story next year about how this new underclassman became a local legend when they talk about the bonfire. I noticed a strong odor coming from the wolf. It stank like a wet dog that went for a swim in urine. I was about five yards away now, give or take, and I knew I didn't have it in me to get any closer. I could also now see that something wasn't right. I could see the outline of the creature's entire body now, and it was not a wolf. The head and the legs looked like they belonged to a large German shepherd, but the torso was human-like. It had broad, muscular shoulders and a large hump of dense muscle on its back. I stumbled back. My foot hit a rock or stick or something. I don't know, but it made a noise and it startled the creature. It then stood up on its hind legs and snarled. I'm five foot ten. This creature was looking me eye to eye. Its breath was hot and smelled horrific. I fell backwards on my butt, scrambled away as fast as I could in that position. I threw handfuls of dirt and rocks in the creature's direction while desperately trying to get back to the fire. The creature ran into the woods while making this whooping, howling noise. The entire party just stared at me in silence. Over the years, that whole incident morphed into a joke about some kid getting scared by the farmer's dog or a coyote. I've even heard a version where it was an unusually large raccoon. I don't blame people. I would probably think the same thing if I wasn't the one who saw it up close. Mike was the only one close enough to really see anything, too, and he won't talk about it. He changes the subject every time I bring it up, so I stopped asking him about it. Sometimes I wonder if something horrible would have happened if we didn't notice those eyes at the edge of the firelight. Maybe if somebody left the party to take a pee or make out in the bushes, this could have been an unsolved murder instead of a local joke. Either way, I guess I'm just glad that we're all safe. Hey Lilith, I've really enjoyed listening to all the stories you post. I usually listen to them in the evenings when I have a fire going. I honestly never dreamed I would have a story to contribute, though. A few years ago, I jumped on the van life trend. I was between jobs and had saved up enough money to be a free spirit for a while. I'd always been adventurous and pictured myself traveling around the United States, and I finally was able to buy a used pop-top van, and then it felt like the whole world opened up to me. It took a while to get some repairs done and get everything I needed for an extended trip, 
but when I was ready, I started up in Washington State and kept going down the coast of Oregon and California. My dream was to follow the sun so I would never have to really deal with winter temperatures. So when November came around, I landed in Arizona. The sun felt good, it was around 75 degrees. I was used to the freezing temperatures of the north with snow at that time of year. And I had never spent any time in Arizona, so I was really unfamiliar with the area. I was fascinated with the saguaro cactus, and I ended up going through Saguaro National Park. Those things were like 30 to 40 feet tall. I realized that they were covered with these little spines, and some of them had an incredible number of arms. They really seemed otherworldly. And then somebody mentioned Coronado National Forest, and I thought I would camp there for a while. National forests are typically free to camp in, and I was trying to save money. So I was planning to be there for several days. I arrived on a weekend and found myself a spot that looked good. There were a few other campers close by, which made me feel pretty comfortable. And it was fun for me to putter around my campsite and get situated. Then when I was ready to look around the area, I found a good trail and I set out. I really loved the terrain there. I had grown up in a completely different area, so this was all new. I grew up in Colorado and was used to the mountain life. This desert area was really enthralling to experience. It was a strange new land. After hiking for a couple of hours, I started to head back towards my campsite. Not long after I started walking back down the trail, something caught my eye in the middle of some of the trees. I could see this strange reptilian creature moving back and forth through the brush. I was so startled to see it, I just stared for a while, and then it turned its head and looked right at me with these yellow, piercing eyes. I immediately started to walk at a fast pace back towards my van. This creature was moving along as well, keeping its distance from me, but tracking me. Then this kept up for what seemed to be ten minutes or so until I reached the clearing where I was parked. I got back to the campsite very shaken and nervous. All my years growing up in the mountains, I had never seen anything comparable to it. From what I could gather, it was very large, and it had stood up on its hind legs at one point. It seemed to be around six feet tall when it was upright, and it had large black claws, and it had a head like a lizard. The horrifying thing was that when it looked at me, it felt malicious. Obviously, I was a complete novice to the area. I had no idea what lived there, but that did not seem right at all. I mean, surely I would have heard of a six-foot-tall lizard before. There would have had to been some kind of information posted on that kind of thing, right? So the rest of the evening was very quiet and peaceful until about two o'clock in the morning when I heard what sounded like this strange mix of hissing and clicking. I had my windows open in the van, and it was loud enough to wake me up. I noticed a few other campers were looking outside. A couple of them came out, and they were milling around and whispering to each other. I came outside and walked over to them. Someone said it was just some kind of an insect or something, maybe a swarm of insects, but that sound was not like anything else I had ever heard. We listened for a while, but then the sound seemed to move away. I decided I would mention what I had seen earlier, and they looked at me like I was a little bit nuts. So, it wasn't just me. The thing I had seen wasn't anything anyone was familiar with. We actually all went back to our RVs. I tried to sleep, but I felt very uneasy. And then the next morning, I woke up about eight. When I stepped out of the van, this woman came up to me and asked if I had heard the weird noises. I said that I did, but had no idea what it was. The woman who said she was camping nearby said she had heard of a few sightings of a lizard man recently. I had never heard of such a thing, and if anyone had mentioned it before, I wouldn't have believed it at all. But after that, I just wanted to leave as soon as possible. And now I'm not sure what to think. I decided that if I would go ahead and head further east and try my luck in New Mexico, who knows what I would find. I tried to find information on a lizard man, but there isn't too much to go on. I thought you might want to get the word out and see if any of your listeners have any ideas on what this could have been. Thank you, Lilith. Hi there, Lilith. 
I'm writing to you because one of your previous callers mentioned having trouble with a scavenger. I'd like to add in my story to see if it helps anyone else because I had a similar experience. So I recently moved back to Philly for a job. I'm a few blocks down from my parents' place. My mom and dad are getting up there in years, so I've been spending a lot of time helping them fix up some things in their house. Now a problem my parents have had for a long time, as long as I can remember, is getting the trash truck to come. Half of the houses on their block have either been abandoned or condemned by the city recently, and the sanitation department will sometimes take their house off the trash route by accident. It's a headache and it means trash can pile up on our sidewalk for weeks sometimes. So, what happened was, about two months ago, garbage started to pile up again, and to make matters worse, we were throwing out more junk than usual because of the repairs. So our sidewalk was cluttered, and our bins were full. One morning, my dad gets up and sees that one of the trash bins was destroyed. My parents use those heavy-duty bins with the animal locks to keep the raccoons out, but this bin had its lid completely ripped off, and everything inside had spilled onto the street. My dad was so upset. That particular can had been used for our kitchen garbage, so it had leftovers and food scraps. We figured maybe an animal smelled it, and it was too good to pass up for them. It was annoying, but I didn't think too much of it. None of us did. It was just a trash can, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But then our trash bins kept getting broken into, even when they were pulled off of the street and it wasn't trash day. And some of them had dents like someone had taken a sledgehammer to them. Of course, any bags we left out for pickup on pickup day were ripped open. And our street smelled and looked disgusting on those days. When the trash guys came, it was so bad they couldn't even collect anything. And those guys weren't picking stuff up off the street. So this went on for roughly a few weeks, and then my mom had had enough. She was completely fed up. She kept asking the neighbors if they had seen anything or anyone out there. They all said no. And at that point, she thought maybe someone had it out for us and was trying to send a message. She even called the sanitation department to ask for extra pickups, but they said no, their trucks aren't available to do that. So it looked like no one was there to help us fix this. So I decided to go to the store and get one of those motion sensor floodlights. I got it, I set it up, and I attached it to the house above the sidewalk in the front of the house, pointed at the trash cans. So my dad and I decided to stay up on a Friday night and see if we could catch the culprit. Sure enough, around midnight we heard the first noise. It was a crash, and we both saw the floodlight turn on and we could see that the noise was coming from one of the trash cans. Something huge and furry was tearing into it. I had hoped the spotlight would scare it away, but it didn't budge. It was too dark to see anything else except the animal's silhouette, and all I could do was see it from the back. But I knew that it had to be bigger than I was. Everything about it was just big and muscular. It looked like it could tear anything apart, anything it wanted to. And I didn't want to go out there, neither did my dad, but we had to do something. So my dad grabbed a block of wood that was still inside from the repairs, opened the door, and chucked it at the animal as hard as he could. The thing barely moved when it got hit, but it did look back. And I'm telling you, it had the face of a dog. And one of those skinny, mean ones, too. Its eyes even reflected the light like a dog's. My dad picked up another block and threw it, and this time the animal ran off down the street. We closed the door and waited. When we were absolutely sure that it wasn't coming back, we went outside to inspect the damage, and everything smelled like urine and sulfur. And now that we knew what we were up against, things started to make sense. It liked our kitchen trash the best. Even though it obviously wasn't one, it seemed to eat like a raccoon. It was a scavenger. The next day, I picked up some rat poison. Before, we had been hesitant to use it because we didn't want to accidentally kill somebody's pet, but now we just wanted to drive the creature away without getting ourselves hurt. Over the next two days, I mixed the poison in with the garbage, and I made sure to sleep over at my parents' house, just in case. We set the trash out for the night, turned the floodlights on, and hoped for the best. 
Everything was a mess in the morning, just like we expected. But we figured we wouldn't be able to tell if our plan worked for at least a few days. Now, mind you, we weren't really setting out to kill this thing. We just hoped that it could smell the poison and move on to somebody else's house. So when I set our garbage out again a few days after that, I was worried that I might find the same thing as before. Destruction. But nothing was touched. Our bins were fine, and this time all was exactly where I'd left them. And it's been like that ever since. So let's hope this creature moved on and is gone for good. Either way, it's gone from our house. I haven't been able to share my story publicly, so I'm really glad that I found your channel. My friends and family have not been understanding, but I know your audience may have some insight as to what happened to me. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 15 years, and I still don't know exactly what happened. I do believe, though, that I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum, or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue, and the next second it was night. It happened when we were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Pennsylvania during the summer. It's really just Amish country where they live, and the roads are often filled with horses and buggies and men and women in similarly styled handmade clothes. When I was a kid, I loved going to my grandma's because it was just so different from the life that I had in New York City. So we'd been there for over a week at this point, and my mom and older brother had been arguing really badly the whole time. We'd had some lunch, and my brother had criticized mom's cooking. They were in a shouting match, so I decided I just needed to get out of the house. Grandma had a small, wooded area behind her house, and I loved to go out there and explore. After her manicured lawn, a small creek divided the woods from the property and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook so I could use that to hop over the water and then also used some big rocks as additional stepping stones. And once I got over the stream and into the woods, I basically just meandered about on my usual paths. Some time ago, my brother and I had set up a tree house, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. So I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift treehouse. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, it was a total shambles, and I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house, thinking I would just tell my brother what it looked like. When I reached the creek this time, there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird, looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. I mean, the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything. So I had no clue why something like this would be happening. But I continued home. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge. But when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house Luckily, I knew the property well, and I made it there without incident. I then flung open the door, and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The looks on their faces I've never seen before. And my grandmother was on the phone with the police. My brother was sitting quietly on the couch, but his head spun as soon as I opened the door. I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked, their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I had been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods, but they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the brook, but they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. 
I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost or disoriented because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking and not in some otherworldly place. Still none of them believes me, and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. When I saw the videos of your channel about portals in the woods and energy fields, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience, and my story was not, and is not, insane. I'm still looking for answers, but I'm just glad that I didn't lose too much time away from the real world. I never saw any other abnormalities in the stream. I have no other weird memories. But I can't easily go back there to check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago. And after that, my family sold the property. But the new owners do seem relatively kind. So I'm thinking of writing to them to see if they minded if I could visit and walk around. I'm not going to mention the strange incident to them, but maybe I'll just say that I want to go back to the area of my childhood treehouse. That should work good enough. Either way, even if I go or not, surely there must be something more to this story. And something paranormal has to be going on with that creek. Hi Lilith. I've been meaning to write in for a long time and finally decided today to sit down and tell you my story. I've been a long-time fan and I'm eager to see what you think of my experience. I hope you don't mind a story with a little age on it because this event actually took place back in the summer of 1995. Granted, I was only about seven years old that summer, but trust me, I remember in crystal clear detail everything that happened. It was a camping trip that changed my life. My family is from a tiny town in Middle Tennessee, and that summer my dad decided to take us to the woods near Turkey Creek, outside Farragut, on a camping trip. It was my older brother's last year at home since he was heading off to college in the fall, and I guess dad just wanted to get in one more camping trip with all of us before the nest started emptying out. I was the youngest at seven years old, also along was my 10-year-old sister, a 14-year-old brother, and my 18-year-old brother as well. Our mom was there too, dad obviously, and the family dog, a red healer cross named Jax. The first night at camp, the only notable thing that happened to us was the battle we had with the mosquitoes. There was also a moment in the middle of the night when Jax woke up and started barking off into the woods at seemingly nothing. Dad said it was probably a raccoon or a deer, and he pulled Jax back into the camper to quiet him down. The next morning, as soon as we let Jax out, he took off on a dead run straight into the part of the woods where he'd been looking the night before. I started to chase after him, but Dad told me to stay put. Jax would come back on his own. There were too many snakes in the woods for me to take off stomping around on my own, he said. I did what Dad asked, and I waited all day, but we never did see or hear from Jax. As it started to get dark, Dad finally suggested to go look for him. My older brothers went one direction, Mom went with my sister in another, I went with Dad. We split up and searched as much of the woods as we could, but nobody saw or heard anything, and soon it was too dark to keep looking. Mom assured us all that if we'd just go to bed and rest, Jax would probably be waiting at the door for us in the morning. It was a sleepless night for me, though, because Jax was my best friend in the world. After everybody else fell asleep, I decided to sneak out and do a little more searching on my own. I grabbed my dad's flashlight and I slipped my shoes on and then I snuck out of the camper as quietly as I could. Dad's earlier warnings about snakes had me pretty nervous. I was walking with my head down and the flashlight pointed at the ground out of fear of being bitten and I couldn't really call out for Jax out of the fear of waking up my family. I guess I was just hoping he would see me and come running. All at once, though, 
I heard a strange snort that stopped me in my tracks. I froze in place, and I pointed the flashlight directly ahead of me. I'd heard about Bigfoot, but I never expected to see one in the woods in Farragut. Every account I'd ever read had come from California, or Colorado, or up on the East Coast, but I swear to you on my life that this is exactly what I was staring at that day. It was eight or ten feet tall, covered in hair and a face that looked almost human, but with the widest nose of a monkey and a very large mouth. I was frozen in fear staring at it, and I couldn't even muster a scream, but to be honest, I don't think it meant me any harm. Mostly it just kept looking at me very curiously, as if it was equally surprised to have run across me. As I stood there staring at it, it extended one massive arm towards me and rested its hand on the top of my head, like you might do when you're petting a cat that has just walked up to you on the street. When it touched me, I got a whiff of this strong, musky odor that I guess knocked my senses back into me altogether because that's when I took off running back to the camper. The big creature thing didn't chase me, though. I think it might have actually taken off running, just as scared in the opposite direction. When I got back to the camper, my mom was already up and sitting on the camper steps waiting for me. I got the scolding of a lifetime. Apparently, if I'd been just a few minutes later getting back, she would have woken up my father, and I would have been in real trouble then. We went back in the camper and laid down, but I didn't sleep a wink hardly at all that night. I also didn't tell my mom what I had seen. I knew she wouldn't believe me, and I was already on thin ice with her for sneaking out. I didn't need to add accusations of lying to the mix. The next morning, though... When we all came out of the camper, there was Jax, safe and sound, and tied on his tether outside. I ran to hug him, and when I did, I smelled that familiar musky smell in his fur. It's as if he'd been carried back to camp under the big, hairy arm of the creature. Dad always said someone else camping nearby must have found him and guessed where he belonged, but I always have known down in my gut what really happened. It's not something I talk about often or freely. The last thing I want is for anybody to call me crazy. But between me, you, and your listeners, there's a Bigfoot in the Turkey Creek woods of Farragut. But don't be afraid. It's just as curious about us as we are of it. Hi, my name's Kelly. And thanks for letting me send this in to you. So I've got a story from about six or seven years ago when my husband and I spent a weekend at Olympic National Park in Washington State. What we like about Olympic Park is that it's quieter than a lot of other parks. It's a great place for when you don't want to see many people. And we spent a lot of that weekend hiking and we're able to have the place pretty much to ourselves. We also like that the hiking trails around there cut through these really old forests. We'd just essentially go and get lost in the trees. We had only three days there, though, just a long weekend, so each day we would leave early in the morning and not come back to the hotel until sunset. So, it was the second day when this happened. Mike and I were a couple of miles in, and we hadn't seen another hiker for hours. Also... This was the farthest we'd gone on the trail so far, which is important because we had never seen this area before. So we get to this spot where the trees are wide open. What I mean is that it's like it's just all these bushes and undergrowth on either side of the trail, not full-grown trees. And it's like this for at least a hundred feet. And all of a sudden, then there's this stink in the air. It's something sour. Maybe that's the best way that I can describe it. My husband is ahead of me, and he stops, then puts his arm out for me to stop, too. He thinks it's a skunk that's been through there, but I don't, because we've dealt with skunks before, and they don't smell like that. This was a different smell. And then he was asking me, well, if it's not that, then what is it? And I didn't know what to say. The thing is, we both wanted to turn back now, because the smell was making us sick, but we also wanted to see what was going on, where it was coming from. 
So in the end, we both decide to push a little further, and then the ground starts to get muddy. And in the mud, we can see that it looks like something heavy was dragged along the trail. And also the bushes were messed up on either side. So then as we continue, the smell is now so bad that I cover my mouth to try to keep myself from puking. And then we get to the turning point in the trail, and there's all this trash stuck in the bushes. Chip bags, burger wraps, that sort of thing. It's just everywhere. And now... The ground feels really sticky. We now figure that the smell is coming from this trash, but my brain also knows that it's not all adding up. I know what a full trash can smells like, but this is worse, and I'm trying to figure out why. And then we see that a trash can has been shoved deep in the bushes, and it's laying on its side with flies buzzing all around, and the stink is strongest at this point. So Mike holds one arm over his mouth, walks over to it, pushes it to roll it a bit. We both start gasping and gagging at the same time. Tumbling out of the inside is a whole deer. It was stuffed inside, and it has these huge chunks missing from its legs. It's all covered in dark, dried blood and is really slimy like it's been there for a while. So now we're at our limit. We turn around and we start running to get away from both what we saw and also the stench. We're also pretty creeped out that somebody killed a deer and shoved it in a trash can. Like, who does that kind of thing? So we quickly make our way back down the trail. I'm thinking and sort of hoping that there has to be some more hikers on these back parts, but we're still all alone. Finally, we're walking downhill and we can see the campground below. It's also basically this resting spot for hikers coming down from above, so it has benches and trash cans. So we're maybe 50 feet up from it and looking down when I first see this big, dark shape coming out of the forest off to the right of the campground and walking in our direction. First, I'm thinking it's a bear because it's got all this dark fur and it's just huge, but then it stands up on its back legs and we can see its face. And this thing is at least 10 feet tall, even though it's slumped over and sort of looks like a gorilla. It's got no neck. It has this flat forehead and that sort of human shape to its face. And then it starts looking around, like it's looking for something. So Mike and I duck behind a tree, but we sort of have our heads sticking out a little bit so that we can see and figure this thing out. And I'm trying to not breathe too loud because it's an absolute beast. And now I'm thinking that this is 100% what took down that deer. I swear we watched it forever as it wandered back and forth like it was looking around for something. It would even disappear for a bit, but then show back up again. And by then, the sun was starting to set and I was worried we were going to be stuck there. Out there in the dark with that thing that I knew could navigate the night much better than us. But eventually it disappeared again, and this time it didn't reappear. So we started to feel a little bit safer. Mike waited a long time, though, before looking back down. The beast was still gone. So we made a decision. We got up. We walked as fast as we could, hoping and praying the entire time to make it back to safety, back to the front of the park safely. We were trying to decide if we should tell park rangers what we had seen. We were worried that it wasn't safe with that thing on the loose, but then again, it's the right thing to do. We need to at least tell somebody about the litter and the dead deer. So I made a compromise with myself, and I decided to just tell the ranger that we had seen a bear and her cubs by one of the campgrounds, and that it looked like they had gotten into some food. He said he would warn people and tell them to stay alert. Mike and I never went back into the park at all that final day of the weekend. In fact, we waited a few years before heading back there to hike again. And luckily, we haven't seen any sign of that thing again. Never since. It still gives me the creeps, though. Anyway, thanks for letting me share. Hi, Miss Lilith. I don't tell many people this story, but something freaking wild happened to me and my friends when we were camping out one night. My buddies and I would throw these raging house parties back in the day. I was a DJ, and I had this amazing sound set up that used to tear the house down. 
I'm talking huge high-end PA system that would get loud enough for a stadium. I had all kinds of crazy lights, fog machines, and visual effects that would turn any dingy apartment into an instant rave. My buddy Jeff was in charge of the booze, and he could whip out professional quality drinks at an amazing rate. My man Kyle had this omelet station that would whip out the most delicious breakfast foods all night long. And Casey was our other roommate, and she was always the life of the party. The morning after one of the craziest parties we've ever thrown, the four of us were in awful shape. We all desperately needed to recuperate, but many of the partygoers were planning on showing up again that night. So we figured that we would just head out and go camping deep in the woods and hide out for a while. We gathered all of our supplies and headed down the road. We found a nice secluded spot in the middle of the woods and set up a sweet campsite. We ended up having such a good time that we actually decided to stay the whole weekend. The last night we were there, we were grilling some hot dogs around the fire, relaxing and just having the best time. Suddenly, we heard this whooping noise coming from the forest. We thought we'd been completely alone all weekend, so this freaked us all out. Kyle got up and grabbed a flashlight. Come on! Let's find what's ever out there, he said, as he headed towards the sounds. Let's just get out of here, Casey said, taking off after Kyle. Jeff and I looked at each other and headed off after them. We slowly crept through the woods towards the whooping sounds. As the sounds got louder, we turned off our flashlights and snuck closer. We saw the fire from a campsite peeking through the trees, and we slowly made our way towards the light. What we saw horrified us. There were these naked, human-like things with unnaturally white skin, large black eyes, and skinny long limbs. They were jumping around the fire, whooping and shouting. There must have been twenty of them. One of us, unfortunately, stepped back on a branch and cracked it. Then they all went silent and looked right at us. All four of us took off back towards our campsite, screaming, panicking, Whatever those things were started whooping and shouting at us as they chased us back to the campsite. Run! Come on! Go! We were screaming at each other. We left everything we had brought and sprinted towards our van. We all climbed in and shouted at Casey to start the van up. She patted her pockets and froze. She had left the keys at the campsite. We locked the doors. We looked in the direction that the creatures were coming from. The whooping and the shouting got louder and louder. But then it was silent. We watched for a while, and we didn't see any of the creatures again. We had to go back and get the keys, though. There was no way around it. It was too dangerous and too far to try to leave the forest on foot. That was a truly terrifying walk back. The forest was dead quiet. We did eventually get back to the campsite. We looked around. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary there. We searched for the keys for a while, and finally Casey found them in her sleeping bag. We pretty much left everything we brought and ran back towards the van. Then we all piled in the van and Casey started it up. The headlights came on and we saw the creatures had us surrounded. All of them stood equal lengths apart from each other and stared right at us. They all looked dead, emotionless. We thought we might be about to die. After a couple of tense minutes, Casey rolled down the window and shouted, We're leaving now! We're never coming back! We will never speak of this. Just let us go. None of them moved at all, and we just sat there. Suddenly, Casey slammed the van into gear and floored it straight towards the road ahead. We were about to hit one of the creatures ahead, and we were all screaming our heads off. As the van went forwards, the creature just bent backwards, and the van didn't even touch it. It was like it went right through it. We sped off, and I looked back at the creatures just blankly staring at us. They watched us make a beeline down the road. As we approached the exit, we looked back. We didn't see them, but then one of us, I don't remember who, looked up. And there they were, looking down at us from the top of the trees. I thought for sure they were following us. They were going to jump down and kill us. But we made our way safely home, safely down the highway. And we never saw them again. My life has calmed down quite a lot since those days, thankfully. My children have asked me several times to take them camping, but I haven't been in the woods since that experience. I honestly don't think I'll ever go camping again. I feel like I have post-traumatic stress from the incident. 
My college friends and I have fallen out of touch with each other, but writing this down has inspired me to try to reach back out to them. I want to see how their lives turned out and what they think of that night all these years later. I don't know what those creatures were, but I know they weren't human, and I know I never want to see them again. Never. In hindsight, as soon as we heard those whooping noises, we should have gotten out of there immediately. But at least I have this crazy story to tell, and we all made it out alive. I wonder how many people have encountered these creatures and didn't live to talk about them. Thanks for reading this, and thank you for all your great videos. I hope you read this on your show, because no one I've told believes me. Honestly, I'm sick of everyone laughing at me. If anyone who hears this has had a similar experience, please say so in the comments. Maybe then my boyfriend will take me seriously. I always go walking on this trail near my house in Massachusetts. It's on the south shore between Boston and Cape Cod. I don't know if the particular place I go to has a name. It's like a forest with mountain bike trails. I usually feel pretty safe, even as a woman hiking alone. I mean, I grew up in this area, so it's not like it's the city or anything. I went a few weeks ago on a Thursday afternoon. I think it was the 24th. And it was late afternoon, there were a few clouds, but I didn't think it was going to rain that day. But boy was I wrong. At first it just started sprinkling, but then it came pouring down, and thunder and lightning too. I was more afraid of the lightning than anything. It was too far to run back to where I was parked, like 20 minutes away. So there's a lot of giant rocks in this area, boulders all through the woods and I saw this rock overhang off to the right of the trail up on a hill. It's hollowed out behind it like maybe there's a small cave or something. I don't know for sure I'm not about to go into a cave, but I thought I could at least stand under the overhang and not get wet. So I'm standing there and waiting for the rain to slow, and I don't know, I guess I just had a feeling like something was watching me. Because the hair on the back of my neck raised up, I felt compelled to turn around and look behind me into the darkness. At first I didn't see anything and I felt silly spooking myself like a kid. There's nothing dangerous in the woods where I live besides snakes, and you don't see them too much. There are no bears or wolves or anything. If something was living in that cave, it was probably a small animal like a fox. At least, that's what I told myself. But when I was staring into the darkness, I saw the shadows shift. I knew something was in there. It didn't look like it could be very big, though at the time I couldn't really see much. Just the way the light moved around it, it seemed way smaller than a person. I wasn't terrified, more like I was uneasy. But I took a step forward and off to the side, away from whatever it was. I didn't want to panic a skunk, that's for sure. The rain was still coming down in sheets, and the sky had gotten really dark. I stood watching the lightning strikes, and few of them were really close. The air had that ozone smell, too. I really didn't want to be out in the open if I didn't have to. The thunder stopped rumbling just for a minute, and that's when I heard it. It was a nasty sound, like a wet sound of something eating. Lip smacking or whatever kind of gross. I turned back around to look in there, but I couldn't see what it was. And then the smell hit me. I guess the wind changed. It smelled putrid, like a dead raccoon on the side of the road. Just disgusting. It made me gag. I turned back to the woods to see if there might be another overhang a short distance away. It was obvious that there was some kind of animal eating another dead animal in that cave and I just wanted to put some distance between me and it. But it was storming like crazy, and I needed shelter. At that point, I wasn't scared, just turned off by the disgustingness of it. I took another couple of steps away from the cave, and now I was getting wet from the rain, and I didn't see any other place to go. And then all at once, I heard a sound behind me like rocks clattering, and I turned around to look. The shadow of the thing inside was rising, 
and I realized all at once that this creature was not small like I thought. It had been crouched down, and now it was standing. I had no idea what this was. Right then it was too dark in the cave to see any details, but it must have been about six feet tall at least, standing up on its hind legs, and it totally took me by surprise. I froze for a second when I realized it was big, not to mention it being up on its hind legs. That was pretty startling. And then the lightning flashed right when I was looking at it, and I could see it so clearly. It was like something out of a nightmare. It had a face like a dog with a snout, only it was like a man, a big man, covered in fur. I could see dog ears on its head, too, the pointed kind. I screamed and stumbled and almost fell down the hill, and that's when it growled, just like a dog about to attack. I swear I thought I was going to die. I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. So I took off running. Screw the lightning. I felt like my life was in danger. Thank God it didn't follow me. Of course, no one believed me. But then I looked it up on the internet, and I saw people posting about this thing they were calling a dog man. I really feel like that is what I saw. That must have been it. And that's how I found your YouTube channel. I want to say thank you for doing your show and for sharing everybody's experiences. At least now, I know I'm not crazy. Hello there, Lilith. My wife and I are huge fans of your videos and we watched all of them several times. My wife has told me multiple times to send in my paranormal account, so I figured I finally would. When I was a kid, my dad had a hunting cabin in the middle of the woods. It was a tiny and simple one-room shack, really, but it was my favorite place in the world to go. My dad and I would get plenty of one-on-one -on -one bonding time, and I would just forget about the rest of the world for a weekend at a time. My dad was an avid hunter, and I would go into the deer stand with him, but I more just enjoyed spending time with him and being out in nature. We had a couple of ATVs that we would bring and drive around for fun. They didn't go very fast, but it was a fun way to explore the woods and to get some wind in your hair, especially when you're a kid. One day I was relaxing outside and I heard this awful roaring sound. I figured it might be a wounded animal, so I got on the ATV to investigate I took off in the direction of the sound, and I ended up going deep into the woods. I turned my engine off, tried to be as quiet as possible, and I listened for the sound again. The forest was quieter than I had ever heard it before. Usually you could hear all kinds of insects, twigs, and all kinds of sounds from the wildlife. But right then, it was weirdly quiet. I listened for a while, and then I figured it must have died. I turned on the ATV and started making my way back up to the house when I heard the sound again. But this time it was way louder and coming from right behind me. The sound was the worst thing I'd ever heard. It was a ferocious roar, but it also sounded like a wolf's howling. Like a combination of a wolf and a lion with a little bit of a demonic growl. It absolutely freaked me out. I wanted to just get out of there, but I was frozen with fear. I slowly looked around behind me and there was nothing there. I debated what I should do. Either I get out of there and go to the cabin for safety or I get a look at what we're dealing with so my dad could shoot it, get rid of it. My curiosity got the best of me and I headed towards the sound. And that's when I heard this awful clicking, bleating sound and I flashed my headlights on it to see what it was. Standing there on its hind legs in front of me, was this giant, furry, humanoid creature with what looked like huge goat horns on its head. The thing must have been about seven feet tall, and it had thick hair all over its muscular body. It had creepy, wide, blue eyes that were staring right at me. Suddenly, the thing let out a terrifying roar and charged right at me. I took off on the ATV, and I could hear it running and grunting and clicking behind me. I was able to get to a part of the woods that I was pretty familiar with, and so I started driving as unpredictably as I could while heading back to the cabin. I finally got to the cabin, sprinted inside, slammed the door, locked it behind me. My dad asked me what in the world was going on, and I told him that I had heard these crazy sounds, and I went to investigate. I told him that I saw this giant goat man, and it tried to kill me. 
I didn't think he believed me at first, but then we heard its demonic roar right outside the cabin. It was close enough that we actually felt the vibrations of this horrific sound. So my dad grabbed the shotgun, charged outside to try and shoot the beast, but it was nowhere to be found. He told me to stay inside and lock the door, and he walked around the cabin to try and find it. After 15 minutes passed, he came back and said he couldn't find a single trace of anything, especially the creature. He asked me where I first saw it, and I tried to tell him where, but I was pretty shaken up. I couldn't really get the words out. So we hopped on the ATV and made our way down to where I had first seen it. We went slowly and quietly as possible. My dad had the shotgun and the flashlight ready. We even made it all the way down to the spot, but the creature was nowhere, and my dad couldn't track it at all. We made our way back to the cabin, and then I told him what it looked like. We researched it, and about a week later, and to my astonishment, there are thousands of accounts of people around Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Texas who have seen a tall, half-goat, half-human. It's famously referred to as the Goat Man. I couldn't believe it. The typical description of what all those people saw matches what I saw. About seven feet tall, muscular, fur all over the body, huge goat horns, and wide-set eyes. They also claimed that they heard the same thing I did, bleating and clicking, roaring and howling. It was very validating to hear that so many people had the same experience as me, but it made me wonder why this information isn't more well-known. Is it possible that the people in power are trying to hide the existence of these creatures from the public? I'm very hesitant to share this story to tell you the truth, but on my spouse's and my first date, I told the whole story. And that's what fueled our mutual interest in the paranormal. We've actually gone ghost hunting. We've camped out at some places commonly visited by paranormal creatures. And we're always researching the latest accounts that people have had. So now I'm sending in my story. Maybe I can convince my spouse to do the same with hers. Dear Lilith, I want to tell you about something that happened to me something that disturbs me even to this day. I don't like to talk about it a lot. I honestly don't even like acknowledging it. But when I was younger, I was homeless for a while. I'd lost my job and things spiraled out of control. I'm proud to say that they've turned around since, and now I have a beautiful family, a good job, an apartment, and a car. I can put food on the table every night, even in these crazy times. But that wasn't the case about seven years ago, and this is when I experienced something worse than I ever could have imagined. At the time, I was living on the streets of New York City. I had to get creative to find a decent meal and a place to sleep that was somewhat safe. One night, I even woke up to rats crawling all over me. As messed up as it was, I was able to find some sense of normalcy through it all. I basically lived on a bench near a bakery and the owner would give me some food that he would have to throw away otherwise. And then he would donate what I didn't eat to a homeless shelter. And he was an all-around nice guy. One night, I was trying to sleep on that bench, and this delightful old lady gave me a cozy blanket. Still warms my heart today to think of her kind gesture during those times, the worst time of my life. I was all bundled up and had fallen asleep when I woke to someone shoving my back. I flipped over to see who it was, but nobody was there. Now, it was common for me to not get the greatest sleep on that bench, so I figured it was just my mind and I tried to get back to sleep. But about a minute later, somebody shoved my back again, and I immediately turned to see who it was. But nobody was around. I just sat there for a while, waiting to see if the person would return. There would be an occasional passerby, but nobody who seemed to be paying me any attention. I decided to try to fall back asleep, but this time I faced the street so I could see whoever it was when they came up. After a while, I was able to get back to sleep, but this time I was shoved right in the stomach. I opened my eyes, and inches from me was this faceless man. I sat up, tried to figure out who it was, blinking, thinking I wasn't seeing correctly but my mind was not playing tricks on me. Standing in front of the bench was a tall, skinny man in a suit with no face. 
I shot up and looked around to see what was happening. And there, peeking around the corner from the bakery, was another faceless man. And then I looked to my left, and standing twenty feet away was another one. I screamed at them to go away, but the two further away started coming towards me. I got up off the bench, and I took off down the street. I ran until I couldn't breathe, and I went into an alleyway to hide. I didn't see them after that, so eventually I settled down, and I decided to just sleep in that alley for the night. Luckily, the rest of the night was uneventful, other than me not sleeping a wink. I thought the dangerous criminals and lunatics in the streets were scary, but from that night I learned there are much more terrifying things out there. Things that we can't defend ourselves against. I stopped sleeping on that bench and I avoided that bakery altogether. I still think about that nice shop owner sometimes, though, but I will never set foot anywhere near that place again. So that event has never left my mind. And once I got back on my feet, I really started thinking about it again, trying to piece it together in hopes that I hadn't gone completely mad that night. I tried to research what those things could have possibly been, but when you search faceless men on Google, all that comes up are the results from that Game of Thrones show. Is it possible that the show exists just to cover the identity of the faceless men? It's a popular show. I've never seen it, but it creeps me out that I can't find any other results for faceless men. I can't be the only person to have encountered these things. At one point, I got to thinking that it could have been kids playing a prank on me. But those figures weren't wearing masks, and I could see the sweat on their skin. Also, they were incredibly fast. When they shoved me, I turned around in seconds, and they weren't there. And they were also too skinny and too tall to be human beings. I honestly feel a lot better writing this to you, Lilith. I'll probably be on a list somewhere now, but I don't care. These monsters need to be exposed. If anybody else out there has had an experience with faceless men, please let me know. Even if you haven't, but you have information or an opinion on what these things could have been, please share that. It was scary enough as a single man, but it's actually scarier now that I have my wife and kid. It creeps me out that they have to live in a world where they could encounter one of these things. But I never told them what happened or what I saw. I'm also grateful to God that I haven't seen any since that night. So I hope and I pray that I never cross paths with those things ever again. Hey Lilith. Back in the day, I lived in a small town in southwestern Ohio, and a group of friends and I used to like to explore some of the abandoned buildings in the oldest part of town. We saw some really wild stuff. The craziest experience we had, though, and the reason we stopped exploring, happened in this abandoned church a block or two up from the railroad tracks. On that day, there were four of us, two boys and two girls, We had brought our usual tools for gathering paranormal evidence, but this time we brought a Ouija board and some other random things with us as well. Things like a deck of cards, a yo-yo, and a compass. This was 1978, mind you, and I honestly wasn't the biggest believer in the spirit world, but I did enjoy the ambience of it all and watching my friends get freaked out. But I became a believer the night we went into that church. The church was well over a hundred years old, built in the 1800s, and was falling apart. We broke the lock on it, which wasn't really all that hard to do, and stepped inside. We were planning on spending the whole night there. We all climbed into the dusty old church pews, and after a bit of coughing and sneezing, we sat in silence to see if we could pick up on anything. My friend Eddie sensed some energy, but the rest of us didn't feel much of anything. Honestly, Eddie thought just about everything was haunted. We lit some candles around the sanctuary to start things up. We started asking questions in the church to get some activity moving. We called out to the congregation, the priest, the choir members, anything we could think of. None of us were the church-going type, so we did the best we could to think of things to ask. And then, when we asked if there were any children in there, one of the candles went out. We looked at each other with a bit of surprise, as I don't think any of us were really expecting anything to happen. 
And then we shifted our focus to trying to communicate with the children. Christina pulled the yo-yo out of her bag and sat it on the piano, and we all moved back from it. I asked, children, would you like to play? The yo-yo moved around a bit, which was enough for Eddie, of course, to freak out. But the rest of us weren't totally convinced, and we wanted something a little more solid. It was an old church, after all. It could have been anything that moved it. My friend Christina said, Children, was that you who moved the yo-yo? And as soon as she said that, the yo-yo fell off the piano. Now that was pretty freaky. Eddie was ready to leave, but the rest of us still wanted to stay and get as much evidence as possible that this was real. We kept asking questions in the main room for a while, but all the movement had stopped completely. So we decided to split up and explore around into some of the other rooms. Eddie stayed in the sanctuary. Christina went into the kitchen in the basement. Ashley also went to the basement, and I went into the priest's office. The office was creepy, especially with just the light from my flashlight. I went over to the old desk, and I sat down in his chair. I wiped off the dust from the desk and started looking through the drawers. There was a Bible, a notebook, some writing utensils, and a bunch of papers. The Bible was pretty cool. I thought to myself I'd be able to use that as an object to incite some activity on future adventures. And the notebook had writings in it about the consequences of sins and several Bible notes to drive the point home. It was a strange thing to read, really. But my thoughts were soon interrupted when I heard Ashley scream. I stopped what I was doing and headed into the kitchen where the noise had come from. When I asked her what had happened, she said that something threw a glass at her. We shined our flashlights down on the ground and saw the shattered glass all over the floor. And that's when the other two joined us. We started snapping pictures all around the broken glass to see if we could capture some orbs. We then got the Ouija board out of my backpack and put it down on the ground and lit some candles around it. If something was powerful enough to throw a glass, it was probably powerful enough to communicate with us as well. We kept asking for the children to answer, but there was no activity coming from the Ouija board. We began asking it questions about the kitchen, the glass, if somebody didn't like Ashley, etc. But no activity whatsoever. But when we were about to move on to another room and try there, one of the candles went out. This also happened to be the candle closest to a cross that was hanging on the wall. We asked what it wanted, and finally the Ouija board moved and spelled out Bible. I instantly thought of the Bible I had just seen, and I ran back to the priest's office, grabbed everything, and ran back into the kitchen. I placed the Bible next to the Ouija board, and we started asking whatever was talking to us through the board religious questions. Is there a God? Is there an afterlife? What's our purpose in life? What happens when we die? These didn't incite any activity. Nothing moved at all in response. So I went over to the notebook and I started reading off the writings on the pages. Suddenly, the Ouija board moved to three, then one, then four. I looked down at the notebook and read a handwritten note. It said Genesis, chapter 3, verse 14. Eddie flipped the Bible open to the passage and read it aloud. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. It was at this point that we were all freaked out and figured it was best to get out of there. We started to gather up everything we brought in and started heading out of the church. And that's when another glass smashed behind us in the kitchen, and we ran. As soon as we got out of the church and to the bottom of the front steps, we stopped to catch our breath. Before anybody could say anything, we heard what sounded like a music box playing and children laughing, coming from inside the front doors. We got the hell out of there as quickly as possible. After a night like this, there was no more denying the existence of the paranormal for me. The places we visited before that night, we might have gotten a few pieces of evidence, but that church was absolutely haunted. The yo-yo falling the glasses being thrown, the Ouija board spelling Bible, and then Genesis 3.14. That was by far the most evidence we got from a single location. And it was all in a matter 
of four hours. So to this day, I wonder, if we had stayed there, would we have gotten hurt? Later, once we developed the pictures and looked them all over, we all agreed that we had captured a couple of orbs in that kitchen. I was honestly surprised we didn't capture anything else. I mean, I was half expecting to see a demon's face somewhere, based on everything that happened. But I guess, in a way, I'm happy we didn't. Hey there, Lilith. I believe that your channel is the best outlet for me to tell my story of what I saw last week. I work up in North Dakota at a truck dispatcher working with flock freight and the like. I'm usually working in the office, but I sometimes get called over to our warehouse to do some work with allocating shipping equipment and things like that. I much prefer the office work, especially during the winter. If you've never been to North Dakota in January, you sure are lucky because the winters out here are incredibly brutal. This season, we had about 50 days that were below zero, and it's very rare that the sun comes out for more than a few hours. If you've ever watched the movie Fargo, you might have an idea of the weather out here. We can get a few feet of snow at a time, and it always sticks because the temperatures never get hot enough to melt it. And then... The entire blanket of snow becomes a thick sheet of ice that's nearly impossible to move. Our guys need to get out there exactly during and after a snowstorm to plow before it starts to freeze. Anyway, on this particular day, wouldn't it be my luck that one of the men who was supposed to plow called off sick? No one else could fill the shift because anyone who was able to plow was already out there plowing. So somehow... I got stuck with the job of shoveling out the driveway of the warehouse. My boss handed me the dinkiest shovel and a company-issued snow jacket and told me to get out there. And I would like to say right here that this was most certainly not in my job description. So during a snowstorm like this, the entire sky basically gets whited out. The clouds become a dark gray that covers up any blue and the world just looks like it becomes a few shades dimmer. The wind was biting me, and I kept on having to pull down my hat or readjust my collar or pull up my gloves. So after about ten minutes of shoveling along the edge, I realized that the snow was melting in through my boots, basically leaking in through the fabric because I hadn't worn my heavy-duty pair to work, thinking I would just be in the office. And all I wanted to do at this point was get home. If I wanted to get home, though, I would have to drive out of the lot, and my car was getting covered and blockaded in by the dumping of the snow. So once I cleared a small path out of the warehouse driveway and onto the road, I headed towards the parking lot to deal with my car. Now, I definitely didn't want to deal with anybody else's car, but I got to work dealing with and clearing mine. I started to push a layer off the hood... The snow was really coming down now, and the wind was whipping it all over the place, making it difficult to see. And that's when out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody walking towards me. The wind was whipping, and the snow was moving like crazy with it. Sharp spikes of ice crystals were digging into my face, but I couldn't move my collar up because I was concentrating on this figure, trying to focus on it and see who was coming. My first thought was that my boss was coming over to ask me to deal with the other cars, or at the very least, his car. But what I saw was not a human. Once the figure got closer, I could see that it had dingy white and gray and brown fur, and the fur was covered in ice particles, so it almost looked like it was shining and sparkling when it caught the light. My brain was still telling me that it was a co-worker in some far-out snowsuit because that's the only thing that really made sense. But when I looked at its face, I realized that there is no costume in the world that looks that realistic. This thing had a gray-black nose, almost like an ape, and it peered back at me with dark black eyes. Above its eyes was this thick brow that protruded like a caveman, and it had white, furry knuckles. But its fingertip pads and palms were bare and gray and its legs were like tree trunks, and it moved like a cross between an ape and a human. It started towards me closer and closer before I finally unfroze. I clicked into gear and quickly pulled out my key and hopped into my car. Now I hadn't finished clearing my windows, so I couldn't see very clearly where the creature was, but then I saw it next to me, and it started circling my car, but never getting closer than a foot away. 
By the way, I promise I am not making this up. After it circled my car, it moved towards my front window and then leaned heavily on the hood. The car started to move downwards under the front, under the massive weight of it. So I decided to lean on the horn, hoping that that would go in my favor and not backfire. Luckily, it worked, and the thing was totally shocked. I still couldn't see clearly, but I felt the car lift back up and then nothing. No movement, no noise. I sat there for about five minutes or so, just hoping and praying that nothing more would happen. I hoped that it had run off in the same way it had come, back towards the interstate and the woods. When I finally got out of my car, my hood was dented in the front, and there was a stink in the air like garbage. I looked down at the snow, and I could distinctly make out the tracks. I started to run back inside to tell my co-workers when this pickup truck started to move into the parking lot. I waved my arms, tried to get him to stop, but I guess he didn't see me, and he went and plowed right through the tracks. I brought out my friends, and even though they could see the tracks in the snow by the woods, they told me that I was just BSing them and screwing around with them. After that day, I haven't really wanted to tell my story, to tell you the truth, but I know that your channel is the right place. If you're based in North Dakota, please be aware that there may be this creature lurking nearby, and snowstorms are definitely not a safe time to be outside. Thank you all for listening, and Godspeed. I was a federal law enforcement officer for many years at the Department of Homeland Security, and I can tell you that I have seen some strange things in my line of work. I've seen things that I can't even begin to explain in a way that sounds lucid. And I know that there are things out there that the general public doesn't know about. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I could get in a lot of trouble, but I will say that there are creatures out there that are not of this world. I've seen them. I can't let you know exactly where I saw them, but I can tell you a bit about what I saw once and confirm that they are not human. I'm not sure what they are, and I don't think that anyone knows for sure, but I can tell you that the government is aware of these things, and they're doing everything they can to keep it all under wraps. They don't want the public to know because they're worried that people would start shooting at anything that moved. I honestly don't blame them for trying to hide it, though, because the truth is mind-boggling. Basically, we're not alone in this world. There are things out there that we don't yet have the technology to understand. They're living among us, and for the most part, in complete secrecy. Unless you've seen them for yourself, you won't believe me. So anyway, the story I feel I can tell you happened about 12 years ago when I was riding home from a particularly intense day at work. I'd been driving down the usual four-lane road I take home, for about five miles when I spotted a dark figure on the side of the road. It was standing on the shoulder with its back to the oncoming traffic and its head turned away from the road. I slowed down to about 20 miles an hour and rolled down my window to get a better look. I couldn't believe my eyes when I got close enough to see it clearly. Up close, I could see that it was very tall and very slender, with long arms that went almost to its knees, but with a smaller head. In a way, it looked like a tall man that was wearing a long coat, but I could see that its body was different than a man's. It stood perfectly still as I passed by and didn't turn to face me, but as soon as I passed it, it walked into the woods. I decided to stop and turn my car around so that I could investigate further, which, stemming from my line of work, is my natural instinct. So I drove back to where I had seen the figure, and I turned the car so that I was facing the woods, and shining my headlights in the direction that it went. I opened the car door and got out. I then closed the door behind me and put my hand on my gun that I always had on me and started walking towards where I had seen the thing. I didn't get far before I started hearing noises around me. Everywhere. It sounded like sticks breaking, or maybe sticks being thrown. I then also started to hear a strange noise, like a scream. I stopped and turned to look, but I didn't see anything. I could still hear the noises, and I started walking towards them, and that's when I saw it. It was standing on the side of the road next to a tree that was about 20 feet from the car. I could see it perfectly. It was wearing what looked like a long coat that came down below its knees, and I 
honestly think it was eight or nine feet tall, and its head was smaller than an average man. I could see right through it, too, but I can't really describe how that looked or how that was possible, but there was no mistaking it. He wasn't solidly there, if that makes any sense. And it was obviously not human, but it was standing there looking at me. I didn't move. I didn't breathe. I just looked at it. It looked at me and then smiled this strange smile, all while the deep black eyes remained lifeless. It was a strange look, though, and I got the impression that it was on guard, like maybe protecting something. I also had a sneaky suspicion that it knew who I was. And now I was close enough that I could get a good look at the clothes, and now I could see that they looked like they were made of some type of animal hide. And I could see a strap around its waist, and another strap around its chest. I think the straps were the only things holding the garment on the body. I was only about 15 feet away now, and no idea what this was, but I knew that it wasn't human. I wasn't sure what I should do, so I just stood there and stared at it. I was still holding my gun, and I was ready to use it if I needed to. Either way, though, I didn't know if I could kill it. Like, if it even was alive, in the sense that we think of being alive. But I sure felt it could hurt me if it wanted to, just from the looks of it. I didn't want to take any chances, so at that point I started stepping backwards and didn't take my eyes off of it. I walked back to my car backwards, the entire way, with my hand on my gun the whole time. Once I got there, I got in and drove off, but continued to look in the rearview mirror every few seconds. I'll never forget what I saw that night. I have no idea what it was, but I know that I saw something that shouldn't exist. And I also have a sneaky suspicion that it knew who I was and that I... Th